bloody war and liberty for their descendants. It is the 29th day of April 2008. We have got an hour and a half left in transmission for the next hour and 15 minutes. Roughly, G. Edward Griffin, really a legend in the alternative media, New World Order resistance uh, movement, one of the you know, last living icons, the great granddaddies uh, in the fight. He's a uh, sharp, handsome devil for, 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 for being in the fight this long. And it's uh, good to have him here with us. A uh, very long bio up on Wikipedia, a lot of different websites, scores of films he's made. He has, uh, of course, the best-selling author of The Creature from Jekyll Island. He founded in 2002 Freedom Force International, and he is in studio with us today. Mr. Griffin, thanks for coming in. Well, thanks a lot, Alex. It's really a pleasure to be here. Well, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, you're going to be speaking tonight later in Austin at UT at 8 o'clock. We'll talk about that later. Right now, tell us about G. Edward Griffin. Tell us about your life. Tell us about the experiences you've had. I mean, I know you don't like to talk about yourself, but I mean, the scope, how long you've been in this, the films you've made. Spend 10 minutes on that. 10 minutes. Well, you're going to lose your audience on this one. Um, there's really not that much. I'm basically a writer, Alex, as everybody knows. Uh, I started into this uh, field, this uh, uh, freedom field, if you want to call it that, in 1959. By 1960, I was up to speed. I was very alarmed with what was going on in the world. And I quit my job, which was a comfortable job with an insurance company, and I became a crusader. And my first issues uh, back in those days had to do with uh, the United Nations. You know, I went through school. I was taught that the UN was uh, our last best hope for peace. Uh, it was a, a means by which all nations could join together in peace and brotherhood and all that stuff. And I bought into it lock, stock, and barrel. And then one day I, I opened up a pamphlet, and the author of the pamphlet was a college professor from some Midwest university, and he was telling me that uh, this was all a false image, that what these guys actually had in mind had nothing to do with peace and brotherhood, but totalitarian control over the world. Well, that upset me, and I didn't believe it, of course. But anyway, you asked about my history. That is the first thing that nudged me and made me start to think about the assumptions that I had. And don't be shy, because this journey, I mean, you woke up back when hardly anybody was awake. This journey is important for other people out there who are having similar journeys, and I think it's an example of what one person can do You know, after they wake up and decide, I want to stand up for goodness. I want to stand up against evil. I want to fight corruption. Well, yeah, I guess that is a, a parallel journey that a lot of people are taking today. And uh, so with that in mind, uh, thanks for encouraging me. I guess the details are perhaps important. Yeah, I mean, you're a trailblazer. Uh, Tell us about that. Well, yeah, that was back in 1960, and uh, I started to give speeches on the uh, the United Nations, and I called it the Fearful Master, <laughs> and that was based on a George Washington quote. You know, the government is not reason, it is not eloquence, it is force, like fire. It is a fearful master and a dangerous servant. So I used that theme as the title for my speech, and then, and then I decided to write a book, and then that went from one thing to the other. The first uh, video presentation I did was a film of another audio, uh, another uh, speech, I should say, that I was giving called The Grand Design. Now, The Grand Design in those days was the development of U.S. foreign policy, which was to get rid of U.S. sovereignty to create a true what they now call fondly the New World Order. And uh, in order to do that, they needed to scare the American people with the threat of atomic holocaust. That was the grand design. So that was the first video I did. And then from there, it just went on down, down the line. I've done things uh, not always having to do with, uh, uh, with political issues. One of the m major works that I consider to be one of the most important things I ever did was something in the field of health had to do with cancer. Uh, I wrote a book called World Without Cancer, the story of vitamin B17, which is a natural control for cancer. It has nothing to do with drugs or chemotherapy or radiation. And I, I learned a lot while researching and pursuing that field. I did a documentary on the discovery of Noah's Ark, which was more for fun, because I've always had an interest in archaeology and ancient Earth history. But most of my work has been in the field of politics or freedom issues. And, and in that field, I would say the creature from Jekyll Island is uh, central. Well, thank you. The creature from Jekyll Island, of course, is all about the Federal Reserve System. And uh, frankly, Alex, when I wrote that thing, I, I really thought uh, I was wasting my time. 
you know, it's a big, thick book. It's 600 and some pages. And I thought, nobody wants to read a big book, or even a small book, for that matter, on the subject of the Federal Reserve. Too dry. Well, much to my surprise, uh, yeah, a lot of people wanted to read about it. And today, it's in its 20th printing. And I just got a call from my uh, warehouse manager the other day saying that we have to go for number 21 now. So it's amazing, and I think that the... Uh, the economic woes that the nation is facing had a lot to do with uh, the public becoming more concerned with an issue that ordinarily they would not uh, think too much about. Yeah, I mean, he made so many other films, though, about Katanga and what really happened in Africa and the UN running the slaughter. I mean, how many films, how many presentations, uh, how many uh, you know visual, uh, you know, video film uh, uh, productions have you made? Good question. Altogether, I'd say there's about 30 or 32, somewhere in that range. Most of them were video, uh, a few, about five or six books, and uh, a lot of audio, actually. Uh, audio is really my favorite medium. Uh, I cut my uh, my tooth, so to speak, on audio back in the days when we used to carry around these uh, big uh, Kodelsky uh, uh, tape recorders, you know, the Nagras, they called them. It was used primarily for film work in Hollywood, and they're very high-quality tape recorders. And I carried two of those around to a lot of lectures and recorded people who were speaking on various aspects of uh, the freedom movement. And then today, actually, I have probably the world's largest collection of original audio recordings uh, in that genre. Uh, I knew that I had the second largest one because I used to go, go around to all of these meetings recording people and I'd run into a particular guy, his name was Harry Laney, who also had another set of, uh, of Nagras and uh, he was an engineer that worked for IBM and it was his hobby to record these things. He had absolutely the greatest collection and then some years later when he passed away his widow called me and asked me if I would like to have his collection. So now I've got his and mine. You need to get some volunteers to like yeah. upload all those to Google Video or Audio I, and, I and get them out to people. I know I have, I mean, thousands of them. You could probably put together like a 20 CD set, too. Uh, 2,000 CD set. I've already converted... You make them data CDs, though. I mean. Oh, data CDs, yeah, yeah, that would be more like it. Actually, I have converted some of them to um, CDs. We call it the Audio Archives series. And I know you've got a lot of, and in fact, a lot of your old films people can still get. My buddy Chris Athanas bought most of them and aired them on local access TV and really woke a lot of people up. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of old stuff, but uh, most of that material, even though it's old, is very apropos. Oh, no, that. because they yeah. just repeat the same thing. Yeah, it's a methodology. Really. Yeah, it becomes even more valuable with age because you can realize with the passage of time that the uh, the issues are re repeating and also that the opinions that we're expressing are valid. The things that we predicted uh, 20 years ago have come to pass. Well, that is the proof in the pudding. I mean, everything you talked about, everything that I've talked about, I mean, we're just going off our own documents. It's... It's all developed. It's all unfolded. And uh, I think that's why so many people now are waking up, because the end game of what we said the globalists, the New World Order would do, the controllers, the architects, if they ever had their way, that they would do A, B, and C, and they're doing A, B, and C. And I think now, how do we capture the attention of all those people and give them goals to try to attain now? And how do we get around all the kooks and weirdos? That uh, and, and and I don't try to be a gatekeeper here. I don't really s try to censor or even cover people I disagree with. But there are a lot of weirdos that just because there's a vacuum with the mainstream media lying and spinning, then you have the alternative media uh, with a lot of craziness too. Oh yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the things that uh, that I deal with daily. We have a, a weekly news service we put out called Unfiltered News. And of course, people send me all this stuff, and they they get upset once in a while because I don't push it through. But I recognize uh, having been at this game for so many years that a lot of this stuff is just nonsense. It's garbage. Well, also, there'll be something divisive. Like, you've got to say it's all the Jews and they secretly drink blood and they work for the Vatican uh, and they're under the control of reptoids. And, 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 and I'm just here saying, hey, I want to fight the globalist system. If we get into arguing about who controls it all day, I mean, I do cover that some, then, I mean, that gets into clicks and balkanization instead of a message of more liberty, more freedom, UN bad, global government bad. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so glad to hear you say that, Alex, because 
because that is that is a pitfall that's I think deliberately put out there by our enemies. They want us to step into those traps, and uh, yeah, we can't do that. But you know what? This business of predicting what's coming in the future. Uh, two days after 9/11, uh, I sat down like a lot of people did and uh, wrote something out. You know, we were speaking from passion, speaking from emotion. The event was so overpowering. A lot of us just wanted to put something in writing to to capture our thoughts and our feelings. Well, that particular day, I started a a. a a writing session that was to go on for a couple of months but on the end of the third the third day I had written something called predictions from 9-11 and I had made uh, 13 predictions and I kinda went out on the on the limb and I I didn't know whether I should publish these or not and I decided to publish them and I'm unhappy to say that every one of those predictions has come to pass. That's what I always say. Unfortunately, yeah. we've been right, and nine times out of ten, it actually is worse than what we originally yeah. said. Go over some of those yeah. 13 and what's happened. Oh, well, some of them are, you know, anybody that studied the world events could make most of those predictions. You know, I, I talked about the fact that they would soon discover uh, that the FBI and the intelligence agencies of the federal government had advanced knowledge of this attack but did nothing to you know, nothing to stop it. I made that prediction. Uh, 